Well, hello, good morning. Welcome to another virtual visit here at the Alaska Sea Life Center. My name is Alex, as always. I want to thank you for joining us today for another trip to the Sea Life Center, kind of taking a look at what you might see here or what you might not see. We've done a lot of behind the scenes lately. Today we're actually going to do one out on the floor, uh, taking a look at something that you might see if you kind of luck into it. It's something that really only happens now and then, and we happen to catch it today. But first, of course, we want to thank our sponsors for these programs, uh, and that is Royal Caribbean Group. So Royal Caribbean Group this year has made it so we can bring these out to you free to the public uh, for everyone to enjoy, and we love bringing you here to the Sea Life Center. Uh, now, you know, if you were here, you would have seen a pretty nice sunrise this morning. It's a little cloudy, uh, as we can expect in Seward. Um, there was a little bit of pink early on, but by the time we started this, which again, these are running from about uh, 8.30 to 10.30 in the morning, um, that pink was kind of gone, but we got these uh, fun cloud patterns that came in, and you will see sort of towards the end of this clip, uh, the sun starts, you know, it starts trying to cook through the clouds. I think we're going to see if we get uh, a little bit of blue sky today as that sun really tries to cook off our cloud cover. Well, let's talk about what we're going to see today. And throughout all of this, of course, I want to encourage you to ask any questions you might have. You can do that by typing in our chat. If you're watching, you know, we're not live anymore. You can, of course, uh, leave a comment, and we'll try to get to those. Uh, but also, you can text us with that number we run at the beginning. Uh, so today, I'm standing in front of our crab tank. And I'm actually going to swap the camera over here a little bit, uh, just move it down for you. Because you might see uh, this crab is in a cage. Um, and uh, you know, we, we posed, why is our crab in timeout? Because this is something we have to do. This, in, uh, in our case here, this is a red king crab. Uh, so why is our red king crab in timeout, because uh, believe it or not, that's kind of what that is. Now, it's not so much timeout as a punishment as it is timeout for protection. And that is because this crab has undergone a molt, M-O-L-T. And we've actually got some time lapse of what that looks like nice and clear. So this is going to look a little creepy. Uh, now, this can take place over an hour. It can take place over a longer period than that. But yeah, you just watched a crab kind of come out of a crab. Uh, and so if you looked close in this cage, I think we've actually got a photo uh, down there of our king molting the other day. Um, and so that, that king molt, when it does molt, that old molt's still in there. And when I say molt at this point, I'm just talking about the skin. So molt can be a verb uh, in the act of shedding that skin. And then it can also be a noun. So we call that old shed skin a molt. And so on the left here, we have the king crab. And on the right, we have its molt. That is its old skin that it came out of. And we do have a, a video of that king molt uh, the other day as well, although we didn't get the whole thing. You can kind of see it just finishing up. And you can see the difference in coloration between this, this fresh crab out of the old molt. And that old molt's kind of dark, uh, and, and it's a little dingier. So let's talk about why they do this real quick, right? Because you know, it, it seems uh, like a difficult thing to do. And then we're going to talk about why, why we have to protect them when they do this. So they do this for a couple different reasons. But the primary reason that our crab here at the center, and it's not just our king crab. We're going to get into all the other uh, animals that we have here that do this, or, or some of the other animals here that do this. But they do this to grow. And you might know, right, king crab get really, really large. We're going to show you uh, a full one in just a little bit. But when they start out, they're not that big. They actually start as plankton. They drift around. Eventually, they become just big enough that they settle out on the floor of the ocean. And that's when they look more like a crab. And they have to molt every time they want to grow. And that's because these animals have hard exoskeletons. We're actually going to kick on over to our handheld camera here. And I will uh, show us the molt that we've got, or show us uh, a couple different molts. So we actually have quite a few here. So believe it or not, these little ones in the front are little king crab molts. And in order to grow out of that, they have to shed that skin. And that's because that hard exoskeleton, the part that's left behind in this molting process, it kind of keeps them trapped inside, right? All their guts are in there. Uh, and as they try to grow, it becomes tighter and tighter. Think about, you know, you aren't wearing the same shirts you were wearing uh, when you were like a kid. Uh, and as you were growing, your parents probably had to go find you new shirts that would fit better because you'd just kind of grow tight into the ones you had. Well, for a crab or for any of our crustaceans here, they can't just go buy a new shirt. They actually have to pop out of that old skin, that tight, too small skin, 
and then they will grow. And so we've got these smaller ones right here, out in front, but off to the side, we have a much larger molt. Let me zoom on out here, see if I can get the camera to focus. So you can see here, this one is quite a bit larger. I'll actually get out there and touch it. So this is about a full grown skin there. So they will do this to grow. That is the primary reason they'll do this, but they will also do it just to refresh their skin. Uh, and so they will get you know, old uh, wounds on their skin, or they'll get things like barnacles that'll grow on their skin. They'll get scratches and nicks and bumps in that skin. And in order to refresh it, they will then grow back out uh, in their new molt. So that's why they do it. But why do we have to protect them? Well, when they come out, they're actually soft. So if you've ever had, uh, you know, like soft shell crab, if you've heard of that, that is a crab that has pretty freshly molted, uh, and it is still pliable, it's still soft and squishy, because they have to stretch their new skin to the size that fits them, their new larger size, and then that skin will harden up. Now, it takes our king crab about two weeks uh, to fully harden up into that new skin. So for two weeks, it's going to be underneath that cage, and that's because when it's soft, the other animals in there could come in and eat it. We've got things in there like sculpin that are you know, pretty, uh, or they can be pretty aggressive. And we actually noticed when this crab was getting ready to molt that there was a sculpin just sitting there watching. Now, how did we know that the crab was getting ready to molt? Does it act different? Well, you know, it's a crab. It's always crabby, as, uh, as people would always uh, point out to try and be fun. But it actually does change its behavior. It gets a little more, not, not crabby, a little, a little more grumpy. It just stops eating as much. We will notice that, that drop in appetite. And in fact, we have a, a video of what it looks like because it gets swollen when it does this. And so you'll notice that uh, the abdomen there, tucked down underneath it, is really, really swollen. And that is part of the molting process. So this was like the morning before it molted. It got super, super swollen. And what it's doing is it's pressurizing that section of its body. And when it pressurizes that, it will eventually cause a split to happen uh, on the back of its body, underneath its back, its carapace, uh, and then it, the, that tail, that little abdomen chunk. And where that rip is, that's where it'll come out. We can look at that time lapse again, because you can see it comes right out at that split. So it needs to pressurize that tail. And that's kind of the telltale sign for us. Like, yeah, it's been eating less. Maybe it's getting ready to molt. But once it swells up like that, once the tail gets swollen, then that is uh, a pretty clear indicator that it is going to molt. Now, I mentioned these aren't the only animals uh, that molt here at the Sea Life Center. One of the, the famous things, or one of the things people notice a lot when they come by, is that our touch tank, we frequently will just have what looks like uh, the leftovers from someone eating all of our shrimp, all of our spot prawns. Uh, and that is, this is actually just from basically a summer. Uh, you know, throughout the summer, you will collect all these little bits and pieces. And these aren't from shrimp that got eaten. These aren't even from shrimp that just died. These are from our spot prawns, and there's actually a couple little crab bits in there, too, uh, that molted. And if we kick on over to our document camera here, I can show you a couple of these molts up close. Oh, we're going to have to deactivate that and reactivate it there. There we are. So you can see some of these molts here. Let me bump up my brightness as I can. And so we have a couple different types here. The spot prawn are the ones that we get the most of. And so those spot prawn, uh, when we get a good molt, we can actually get like an intact molt pretty much here. And you can see it splits that same place that the crab splits. So right behind its back and right before the tail. Uh, and they'll kind of pressurize their tail as well. And then they'll just squeeze on out of that skin. But we love finding all sorts of different little molts in there. So we've got these tiny little crab molts. And I love that we almost have like a successive molt here. So because we have a really teeny tiny little one there. And then right here, we've got a larger one, but same type of crab. And then, of course, you can see some really tiny ones in there. And these are pretty fragile. So I, I don't want to try and get those ones out of there. Um, because these molts are actually pretty, pretty delicate. Uh, when they dry out, they're just leftover skin. And so for us to get an intact one, uh, that's actually kind of a, a nice little treat. Uh, to, to get one that we can show people, show them the entire animal. You can see all of the legs on there. They've got little pincers. The antenna actually being intact is super fun as well. But I do want to point this one out down here. And this is going to bring us into uh, the other animals that we have living here. 
So this is a claw from a hermit crab. I'm going to zoom in a little bit, but our camera isn't dealing with the darkness too well. So that's just a claw. You can kind of see the end of the claw. Uh, and when you find a hermit crab molt, a lot of times we don't get an intact molt off of them. Um, but we, we get little fragments. And the claw is a good one. But we aren't the only people that find these. Uh, in fact, we aren't the, the only animals that find these. Sometimes other animals will find these. And they, they won't necessarily eat them. There's not a lot there for them. But they will uh, live in them. So this is a hermit crab that has decided to live inside the molted claw of another crab. So uh, that's just kind of an example of one of the other animals we have here. We're going to talk a bit about our hermit crab in just a moment. But of course, I want to encourage any questions we might have. I'm just going to check with Taylor. They're running our computer today. Taylor, we got any questions over there? Yeah, we have a couple. Okay. Got a couple texted in. One of our first ones that we have is, do the crabs eat their old skin? Ooh, that'd be kind of gross, right, eating that skin. But there, uh, there are kind of thoughts on it. There are people that raise crab that will leave that molt in for them to eat. Um, and they think maybe they get some calcium back out of that molt. Um, with our crab as it is in there, and we can actually cut on over to uh, our crab just chilling in there with its skin, uh, it doesn't care. It's, it's not in there. It's not really eating that. Um, our system is an open system, to, to, to be truthful, right? So we are pulling in seawater. There's plenty of calcium in our water here. We're getting that natural balance of things. But we have never seen our crab uh, then eat their molt. It's just not something we see with them. So we'll leave that molt in there with them, um, but they don't, they don't really pick at it. Uh, so that's a great question. They don't, we don't see them eat it, uh, although there are some people that think, you know, maybe in a closed system that they could eat it for, for renewing calcium. We have another question. Okay. Do they ever stop molting? Ooh, so that's a good question. I did mention, right, that they, they do it to grow. So what happens when they're, they're kind of done growing? And they will get to a, a size where they're basically not going to get any larger, uh, or at least not noticeably larger. They're still going to grow. They're going to grow slowly. And they will uh, continue to molt, but the molt will also slow down. So when they're going through a growth spurt, when they're you know, really little and they're trying to get really big uh, and they're growing very rapidly, they will molt frequently. Uh, basically, every time they get a little too big for that skin, they have to molt, right? Well, once they get older and they're, they're kind of full grown uh, and that growth slows down, they still molt. It's just maybe they'll do it one time a year instead of a couple times a year. Uh, and so for our crab here, right, we just kind of keep an eye out. We're like, oh, appetite's down. And then we look for that swollen uh, nature to it. And we're like, yep, there it is. It's got uh, that, that swollen belly there. And we are going to put the cage on it and Hopefully, that's the only time this year that we're going to have to watch out for this animal. And that cage will stay on it for about two weeks uh, until it grows back. And we've actually got footage here of them putting a cage. So you can see it's, it's kind of cumbersome <laughs> getting this cage up and over and then dropping it down. And the crab was up against the, the wall of the tank, actually, that morning. Um, so they, they had to kind of like hover it over it. And they had a little stick that they kind of like tapped its leg with, like, hey, you want to move? And finally, it moved into place and they were able to get that cage down on top of it. That's a great question. So let's talk about some of those other crab that we have here at the Sea Life Center. Let's start with the hermit crab, because we just talked about the hermit crab actually using the other molts of crab. And hermit crab also have to molt, but something else they have is they can outgrow their shell. Uh, and that is not, I'm not talking about their exoskeleton. I'm talking about the shell they carry around. Uh, that is not grown by the crab. We get this question a lot at the touch tank. Because people are sometimes a little unsure, do they grow that shell or not? And no, these are leftover snail shells. So not only do they have to molt their skin because it gets too tight, but eventually they will outgrow that shell and they, they don't grow a new one. They have to go find a new one that will actually fit them. And when they do that, they'll kind of wander around. Uh, we see them in the touch tank trying out new shells. And sometimes they'll even hop out of the old shell, hop into the new shell, sit in the new shell for a day or two. And then they'll hop back into the old shell. They try it out, and sometimes they get a little bit of like eh, buyer's remorse. And they'll try to get back into their old shell. So we do provide them with these shells in the touch tank. Uh, one of the big ones that they get are hairy tritons. So we have hairy triton snails in our touch tank, which uh, if you're watching from Oregon, it's actually the state, uh, state seashell of Oregon is the, the hairy triton. Uh, but they will use those shells a lot, and we have a lot of them here. Looks like maybe another question? Yeah, well, I actually have a question. Okay. So you were mentioning that whenever uh, the king crab molted, very vulnerable. Yeah. Very, very vulnerable. 
Same thing with hermit crabs, I'm assuming so. Yeah, so when they molt, um, they're soft, again. But a, a hermit crab already kind of has a softness to it, which is part of why they carry that shell around with them. Um, and so when they're looking for a new shell, they, they can be vulnerable there. Yes, and they actually have to get out of the old shell and kind of swoop themselves into the new shell. And if you watch them do it, I mean, it just takes them a couple seconds. They have to be fast uh, because that's like when something could really swoop in and get, get them, right? So, uh, so that's our wide hand hermit crab. We have other varieties of hermit crab here at the center as well, but they all kind of have that same role. And like we saw, the one using the, the claw of the other crab, uh, just one of my favorite little clips here, um, because it, there was no shell small enough in the, in the touch tank for this little crab uh, at the time. And we have little tiny uh, hermit crab that every once in a while we see them in the touch tank. We're like, uh-oh, you don't have a shell. And we, we, you know, usually whoever's working the touch tank might try to find them a little shell. Um, but they'll also use things like the, the empty shells of the tube worms that build their, they, they build these like hard coiled shells on top of the rocks and that protects the soft worm. When the worm dies, there's just this empty shell left over. It can't move. So hermit crab that use those, the, the, the crab that tucks up inside of an old tube worm shell, can't move anymore. It's stuck where it is. Uh, but at least it's protected. And it can kind of have its little claws out and grab at food that comes through the water. The other day, I saw a pygmy rock crab in a shell, a snail shell, just hanging out, just, desperately trying to be a hermit crab. Just hiding in there. Just we, hiding. We can cut over to the document camera because we've got the little, uh, the little rock crab here. Um, so you can see this is much more of like your, your typical looking uh, crab. And so, yeah, these don't need a shell like, uh, like a hermit crab does. These a lot of times will tuck down under rocks. But yeah, I mean, I, I've seen them hiding inside the shell, kind of peeking out if they're small enough to get in there. Uh, and, and, you know, it's just an extra little bit of protection for them, like a little den. Because they don't want to just be out in the open. That is vulnerable even if you have a hard shell. If you're a little crab, something like a rockfish would just come by and gulp you up and just swallow you whole. Uh, so you, you do want to hide when you're little. And that's where the king crab, right, eventually just gets so big, not a lot can eat it except for people, and, and we love to eat them. There are some other animals out there that will get them as well. So we're going to take a look at another crab here. We're going to take a look at the scale crab. I love the scale crab. This one is usually hiding under a rock, but we have one in our microhabitats here. If you watched our microhabitat episode, we actually talked about the scale crab there. Um, and because it's in that microhab, you can get right down close to it. You can see under the rock there where it's hanging out. And as we uh, look a little closer on it, actually, you'll be able to see the scales, uh, which is why it's called a scale crab. It's kind of got that weird uh, scaly nature to it. it. Looks like we have a question on the YouTube here. Yeah, so Margaret says, it seems surprising that the king crab legs can squeeze through the narrow joints of its exoskeleton. I guess that proves that its body has to be super soft as it molts, yeah? Yes. So, yeah, there, there's a lot that they, they squeeze out of a tiny little space, right? Um, and part of that pressurization in their abdomen is kind of moving things around uh, inside their guts as well. But they are very soft when they come out. Um, and they're soft. They're not just soft. They're a little deflated. Look at this leg towards us that's dragging on the ground. They don't even really have full power in that leg yet when they're molting. Or if we watch the time lapse of them coming out, they kind of just flop out and they'll sit there and they sort of reinflate parts of themselves. So yes, they do squeeze out all those tiny little joints. Uh, and you see it's, it's, it's a tight little squeeze and it's just gonna lay there. But it can't really walk around, it just kind of flails and it's just trying to get everything pumped back up and all the muscles back in order. Uh, so it is, it's a tight squeeze. And they don't just shed their, their skin like we would think of it. Um, they're also shedding things like their gills uh, if we look at the, the crab molt video, kind of where it's coming out, we might be able to see um, sort of the, the gills streaming back behind a little bit. There's some like feathery material there, uh, and that might be a little bit of gill matter. I don't think we have a good shot. We might have a little bit of a good shot of it on our hand cam here. Let's see what we got. So yeah, if we tuck up in there, there's some softer tissues as well uh, inside there. Doesn't look like it's showing too well, but they'll shed parts of their gills, um, and they'll also shed parts of their eyes. <laughs> um, so we have a, a great clip of a Dungeness crab we can pop up, and you can see those cute little eye stalks. I love them. They tuck them down, they'll hide them, they'll clean them, um, but they'll actually shed those, right? Which, I mean, that's their eye, um, so they will shed uh, the sort of outer coating of that eye off when they molt. Another question. Yeah, we have actually a couple more. Okay. So can the crabs regrow their limbs? All right, that's a great question. People hear about like, ah, oh, the crab's gonna 
regrow an arm that it lost or something like that. And they can, um, but it requires that molting process. So if you have a crab that's maybe only molting once a year and it loses a limb or it gets really damaged, that damage itself could cause it to start the molting process. It could go, wow, I really need whatever I just lost back. I'm going to start the molting process. But that is an intensive process. And so if it just lost like the very tip of a leg and it's like, eh, that's all right, that may not actually trigger a molting process on it. Um, if the damage is uh, severe enough, then it can trigger that molting process. But through the molts, uh, two, three, four molts in, it'll have almost that, that full limb back in a lot of cases. Um, and things like scratches on the carapace as well. If it got a big nasty cut that doesn't get infected and doesn't kill the animal, um, if it can molt, it'll actually re-smooth uh, out that surface, right? Kind of buff the new coat, as, as it were. Another question. What does the Sea Life Center do with the molts? That's a great question. We're going to toss back on over into the hand cam here, and we'll go look at some of the molts, because we keep them uh, a lot of times. Uh, and so we've got this little uh, display here of a bunch of different crab. And we will actually keep these molts. Let's see if I can get this to stay focused. There we go. Uh, and so, as you can see, you know, when we are really little tiny, we love to get any sort of unique molt. Uh, we've got stuff here, maybe a Puget Sound king crab. And then over here, this is a box crab, which um, we used to have box crab in our touch tank. And it was fun to be able to show them off because they tuck themselves in tight. Um, let's see if I can zoom in without losing my focus too bad here. So the legs, I'm not sure I can show them, are right there. And they actually fold up into the body. Uh, and it'll hide that way. It just looks like a rock. It kind of feels like a rock. It's like a little tank uh, closing all of its hatches. And that's actually not the only crab here that uh, can hide. We're going to show uh, our decorator crab. I think that's going to probably be our last crab that we talk about today. But we got a couple cool clips here. This is one of my favorite animals here. So here on the left, in one of our microhabs, we have a piece of algae. You may have seen this clip before. I, I absolutely love it. And on the right here, it is not a piece of algae. That's actually a crab with another hermit crab on it. And you can see the little leg there at the bottom of this decorator crab. So decorator crab will, uh, we've got kind of a close-up of them, where you can see that they, they take little pieces of uh, algae or sponge, uh, and they'll actually stick those on themselves. They kind of have um, like these little coiled, uh, curled barbs on their skin that work similar to Velcro. Uh, and so when they, uh, when they bring in that uh, you know, algae and they stick it to themselves, they will actually cause that algae to stay on their skin. And if you stick enough algae on yourself, then you can blend right in. Looks like a question on YouTube there. Ellie wants to know if crabs bite people. All right, we can talk about crab and whether or not they're going to get you uh, if you're at the beach. And while we're doing that, I think we'll toss on over to, uh, we've got one more uh, little uh, decorator crab there, our zoanthid decorator crab that we're going to take a look at. So crab, do they bite people? Uh, they're not really biting with teeth, but of course they can pinch you. They use those pincers uh, to defend themselves. So they're, they're not really coming like after you to get you. But if you stepped really close to one, or you, maybe if you were out tide pooling and you, you picked one up, or you, uh, you were reaching under a rock to flip it over, uh, and there was a crab right there, it can totally pinch you. Um, and some of the crab have just massive claws um, and uh, as far as their, their body size go. Um, so this clip here, we're going to let this loop back around real quick, and we'll get back to pincing. This is another decorator crab. I wanted to let this run through to see if you saw the crab. So we have zoanthids, which are related to our sea anemones, and they're related to corals and jellies. Uh, but also in this tank, there is a decorator crab that has not covered itself with kelp or algae or sponges, but it has instead become covered in zoanthids. So you can see right there. You can see those legs kind of sticking out. And this is actually shot a while ago. I think nowadays it's pretty much just straight covered in the zoanthid, so it really blends in. So talking about, do they bite you? Um, their mouth parts aren't really designed for biting. Uh, they've actually got you know some little plates that they have. I think a close-up of the, the dungeon crab that we had earlier, you could see those plates. And they'll, they'll just pick little things apart. So they're not going to like chomp on you. They're not trying to eat you. But yeah, they might pinch you. And that is them because they're scared. <laughs> they're worried about this giant human near them. So they can pinch. I, I, I certainly won't tell anyone, like, nope, not going to pinch you. But in our touch tank, a lot of folks get worried because they think every crab's just going to grab you or they're going to come right after you. And there are some aggressive crab out there, things like uh, blue crab, if you live over by Maryland, for example. 
Those will swim after you. <laughs> if you if you really if you really get in their area, they will come at you. Um, but in our touch tank, we've got tons of little crab. We've got those little uh, hermit crab. We've got some little decorated crabs in there, liar crabs, and they they don't just like come after you. Um, we always just recommend to people, you know, be gentle with them. Touch them one or two fingers, nice and gentle. Don't give them a reason to think that you're there to hurt them, uh, because then that's when they, they really get pincy. So they, they can, but uh, they're, not, they're not doing it to be mean. Any other questions there? All right. Well, I think we'll start wrapping this episode up here. Of course, I want to thank our sponsors again for... Uh, making this whole season uh, free to the public where we can just stream it on out there. And that is Royal Caribbean Group making it free this year for us to bring you to the Sea Life Center virtually. And we always want to thank you for tuning in. We love doing these programs, and these are every Wednesday at 11, Alaska time. Uh, for anyone that might be tuning in outside of Alaska, we uh, especially thank you for figuring out your time zones and tuning in. Uh, if you're watching this not live and you had a question you really wanted to get answered, you can leave a comment on this video, and we'll check those and hopefully get your question answered. Or you can also email us at asktuffy, which is A-S-K-T-U-F-F-Y, at alaskasealife.org. And uh, we'll check that email, and we can uh, make sure we get any questions answered for you. So if you just bolt awake in the middle of the night going, like, gosh, I wish I had asked blank, uh, hopefully we can get that answered for you. I'll do one last check. You got any final questions there? Looking good. Nope. All right. Perfect. Well, thank you so much for joining us. We hope to see you next week for another virtual visit. So long.